Experiment 2 in Chem 1211 is titled Precision and Accuracy of Measurements, and there are two overarching goals for this experiment. The first is to really solidify your understanding of laboratory glassware, particularly in the context of the precision and accuracy of different types of glassware. So in this experiment, we'll really learn how to prepare solutions reliably so that we know their concentrations and we can use them to reliably and with confidence conduct chemical experiments. The second goal is to gain a deep appreciation of scientific measurements, and in particular, these two concepts of precision and accuracy. So we'll talk about both how to quantify precision and accuracy within a set of measurements, and also a little bit about how different types of errors impact precision and accuracy. There's a deep connection between random errors and the precision in a set of measurements, and systematic errors and the mean and percent error within a set of measurements. So we'll deal with those a little bit in this experiment. In the first part of this experiment, we'll be massing packets of sweetener. And if you look on a packet of artificial sweetener like Sweet n Low, you'll notice that there's a mass printed on the packet. In our case, it'll be something like 1.0 grams. This is what's called the nominal mass of the contents of the packet. It's the mass in name only, and the manufacturer makes no guarantee that the actual mass of sweetener within that packet is exactly, in fact, 1.0 grams. It's just a ballpark figure. But for our purposes, we're going to use the nominal mass as the true value, because if the manufacturer is doing their job right, then the distribution of masses of sweetener within packets should be centered on 1.0 grams. In other words, the mean of a bunch of packets of sweetener should be 1.0 grams. In the first part of the experiment, we're going to take five packets of sweetener and an empty packet so that we can subtract out the mass of the paper that's used to contain the solid. And we're going to mass them on a single balance. And you'll want to record the balance number that you use for this. Let's say it's something like number three. From this, we're going to get out five masses of five different packets of sugar, and let's say one of them is something like 1.051 grams. This is what we call the measured value. When we actually go to mass the contents of the packet, the measured value we get is 1.051. And indeed, that's not exactly 1.0 grams, just as is suggested by the term nominal mass. We do that for all five and get a mean, it might come out to something like 1.063 grams. The important thing to note here is that the 1.063 gram mean and the 1.0 gram nominal mass are not equal. In more fancy scientific terms, the true value and the measured value are not equal. And this is an indication of inaccuracy. The measurement is inaccurate because it's not exactly equal to the true value. Now, in this case, the nominal mass is just a named mass by the manufacturer, but often the nominal value or the true value will be something that's based in theory, and inaccuracies in that case can indicate important limitations of the theory or of our measuring instrumentation. To quantify this inaccuracy, we're interested in the distance or the difference between the measured value and the true value, and a great way to quantify this is through the use of the percent error. So to a first approximation, how do we quantify inaccuracy? Well, it's just the distance or the difference between the true and measured values, a simple subtraction problem. But an important thing to realize is that value or that difference alone doesn't give us enough context to really appreciate how inaccurate a measurement really is. For example, here that difference is only 0.063 grams, and we can say only because that's a relatively small percentage of the actual true value, 1.0 grams. If we're measuring milligrams or nanograms, then a difference between true and measured values of 0.063 grams turns out to be massive. To appreciate the scale on which we're working, we need to divide that difference by the true value. This kind of normalizes everything so that we're seeing that difference as a percentage of the true value. It brings the inaccuracy difference typically between 0 and 1. And because we don't care whether the measured value is greater than or less than the true value, we can take the absolute value of this so that we get a positive value all the time. And then to make it a percentage, we can multiply it by 100. So unless the measured value is grossly different from the true value, the percent error will fall between 0 and 100%. And percent error 
is a measure of inaccuracy that's independent of the magnitude of the true value and gives us a feel for how well we did with 0% being perfect and 100% error and anything higher than that being really, really bad. In the next part of the experiment, we'll take five different balances, which I've listed here as no numbers one through five, and measure one packet of sweetener on those five different balances to get five different masses for the same packet of sweetener. So we might get something like this, 1.054, 1.051, etc. Now here, we're interested again in the percent error of these values from the nominal mass, but also in the spread of values among the five. If we look at these five values, we can see that their mean is somewhere on the order of 0 0.58, 0 0.59, something like that, maybe a little lower. But they're all individually different from that mean. So if we imagine kind of a second target where at the center of the target is the mean, each of the individual measurements are spread about that mean. And that spread is a measure of what we call imprecision. The greater the spread, the less precise is the data. Imprecision comes from random errors within the experimental setup. The balance being quirky because of vibrations on the lab bench or because the AC just turned on. Things we can't control. Things that are out of our control and that lead to apparent random variations. To quantify precision, we use standard deviation. And like the percent error, we can build up the standard deviation formula using logical arguments. So one thing to note about precision is it's all based around the spread or distance of each data point from the mean value. So if we represent the mean value here as x bar, then the difference x sub i minus x bar for a particular measurement x sub i is related to the precision. Let's take that and square it so that we remove this issue of positive or negative deviations and then let's sum over all of the measurements. So what we've done is we've taken all the measurements, their distance from the mean, squared it, and then added all of those up for all of our measurements. Here we have five, so we'd have five terms in this sum. And now let's divide by n minus one to essentially create an average. Why is it divided by n minus one rather than n? We won't get into that. You'll get into that later if you take analytical chemistry. But for now, take my word for it that we divide by n minus one when calculating the standard deviation. And then, since we squared the deviations inside the sum, let's take the square root of this whole thing to get a more or less average deviation for each measurement from the mean. The greater the standard deviation, the greater are those x sub i minus x bar differences, and the greater the imprecision in the measurement. The second part of this experiment will be looking at the precision and accuracy of different types of glassware for measuring liquids. And so I'm going to introduce here the three different types of glassware we'll use in the laboratory. So the first is called the graduated cylinder. It's just a long glass or plastic cylinder with markings on the side that are called graduations, hence the name graduated cylinder. The second is a pipette, a long thin tube with a nozzle at the end through which liquid can come out. This is called a serological pipette. It's constant width the whole way up, and it's got graduations just like the graduated cylinder. It's much thinner than the graduated cylinder, which affects its precision and accuracy, as you'll find out in the laboratory. Then finally, we'll use a volumetric pipette. A volumetric pipette has a wide bulb at some point along the length, but otherwise it looks similar to a serological pipette. It lacks graduations except for one mark at the top above the bulb, and this is an indication of a single volume. So volumetric pipettes can only be used to measure a single volume of liquid, but the thing is, once again, as you find out in lab, volumetric pipettes are really, really good at measuring that one volume. For each of these three types of glassware, we're going to measure 10 milliliters of water multiple times and get a mean and standard deviation for the masses and volumes of water delivered by each type of glassware. Two big questions I want you to think about as you do this are, firstly, which glassware is most accurate and most precise? And it's not necessarily true that the most accurate glassware and the most precise glassware correspond, but if they do, that'll be interesting. And then why? Why is it the case that some of these are more accurate and precise than others? And can you use the design and the way each type of glassware is engineered to explain the accuracy and precision. 
In the final part of the experiment, we'll prepare solutions and we'll dilute those solutions and then take some spectroscopic measurements of each solution to illustrate how concentration and absorbance are related. We'll work with a 1 times 10 to the negative 4 molar solution of Kool-Aid, and the capital M that you see stands for moles per liter of solution. Remember, that's the definition of molarity. So to prepare this solution, you'll mass out the appropriate amount of solid, either blue or red Kool-Aid powder, to place in, I think, 100 milliliters of water to prepare the solution. You'll then take this solution and put 5 milliliters of it in a test tube and prepare dilutions from what we call this stock solution, 1 times 10 to the negative 4 molar Kool-Aid will be our stock solution, by adding varying amounts of water to varying volumes of the Kool-Aid stock. So we'll do, for example, 4 mils of water, 1 mil of Kool-Aid, 3 mils of water, and 2 mils of Kool-Aid, etc. An interesting problem that comes up is what's the concentration of Kool-Aid powder in these diluted solutions where we've added water. So for example, if we take the solution that contains one mil of Kool-Aid stock and four mils of H2O, how can we determine the final concentration of Kool-Aid powder in this diluted solution? Well, we can use what I call the dilution relation. C1V1 equals C2V2. C1 and C2 are concentrations. V1 is the volume of stock used, or the initial volume before dilution, and V2 is the final total volume after dilution. So V2 in this case is 5 milliliters, since we're taking 1 milliliter of Kool-Aid stock and diluting to a total volume of 5 milliliters. You'll sometimes see the C1 and C2 written as capital M1 and capital M2. I like to use C to avoid confusion with mass, but you will see both of these used. To really appreciate the essence of this relation, note the units that result when we multiply concentration by volume on both sides. Really what it's telling you is that the moles of solute are equal to the moles of solute. So the moles of solute before dilution are equal to the moles of solute after dilution. We didn't add or take away any molecules of solute. And so the moles before are equal to the moles after. All we did was add solvent. So in setting up this particular problem, for example, C1 times V1 is equal to the 1 times 10 to the negative fourth moles per liter, that's the initial stock concentration, times 0.001 liters, that's the 1 milliliter of stock that we use, that's the initial volume. That's got to be equal to the final diluted concentration, C2, times the final total volume, 0.005 liters or 5 milliliters. Little bit of division, little bit of rearrangement, gets us to that C2 concentration. 